I'm with Alana Heidelman from the Israel Forever Foundation. Now, Ilana, what is Israel Forever Foundation? Israel Forever is an international nonprofit that works to celebrate and strengthen our identity as members of the nation of Israel. So while we are a Jewish organization that strengthens Jewish literacy and unity, we have many non-Jewish friends from all over the world who join in our effort to demonstrate the destiny of the people of Israel. When we started and why we started? We started actually about 20 years ago originally when Danny Ayalon was the ambassador of Israel to the United States and he approached my parents who are big leaders in the Jewish world and they decided to create this incredible opportunity to recognize Israel's contribution to democracy, civilization and humanity. Some of the initial projects that we were involved in including helping Iranian Jews escape and find freedom and other projects that we had built up over the years then blossomed into an incredible organization about 13 years ago. We're coming into our bar mitzvah year and we have shaped ourselves as a content and engagement provider to enable real people to weave an understanding of Israel and her significance as a people, heritage, and homeland into the nature of their lives. That it's not something only political, it is not about personal political bias, but rather about the destiny that we do carry for the thousands of years that we've been a nation. And tell us about some of the programs here, and I've noticed on your website you have lots of programs. Tell us about some of them. Sure. Some of the programs are geared towards a more educational direction, where we're able to actually provide insight and information to increase the knowledge on history. So we have our Jewish rights movement that looks at the history of Jewish rights movements throughout time. We also have initiatives that are artistic and creative, providing for families, schools and others, um, artistic activities that they can do, and most importantly, I think, are some of our conversation starter programs. These are helping people, when they're sitting with their family or when they're with their colleagues, have a sense of how they can start the difficult conversations that need to be had in today's volatile times. Now, Britain wrote a white paper called the Balfour Declaration, and you have the Balfour Initiative. Tell us a bit about that. Absolutely. I, we were proudly involved in the international celebration of the Balfour Declaration's 100th anniversary. We believe very strongly that Balfour, as a Christian Zionist in his time, was really a leader who took the initiative of recognizing the natural Jewish rights to self-determination in our ancestral homeland. We carry on that message by emphasizing how Balfour can be an inspiration not only to young Jews, Jews who question Jewish rights to the land, but also how it can be an inspiration for non-Jewish Zionists who are trying to understand why would people support this Jewish people in a land that nowadays has been really sold as if we have stolen it. And the Balfour Declaration is proof that there is a legitimacy to the ancestral connection. So the Balfour Initiative is something we're very, very proud of. And it's the Bible as well that connects you to the land, isn't it? Absolutely, but nowadays you can't use that in an argument. You're not allowed in most cases to use the Bible as a reference point as to why Jews have a right here. Now, if you want to be able to look at the Bible as a historical document as opposed to a religious document, then you have to turn to the purchase of the cave of our forefathers, Maharada Machpelah, in Hebron. These types of purchases that are documented in so many different versions even of the Bible, they have to serve as proof, legal proof. So I think that between international recognitions such as Balfour's Declaration and ancestral recognitions such as in the Bible and also Cyrus, allowing for the Jews to be returned, also recognizing to their ancestral homeland. So every knowledgeable person today who has not a position that is political, but rather a personal interest in integrity, then they should be recognizing that what's happening in the streets and what's happening in the media is all trying to distort the very facts that we are are recognizing exist. And they have one program called the Holocaust and Hatikva. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I'm a Holocaust educator for many, many years, and I did my PhD with Elie Wiesel, who I try very hard to carry on his legacy of the transmission of Holocaust memory. But I do so in a reflective learning 
method. So whereas on one hand we have Links in the Chain, which is our Holocaust education initiative, we also have Holocaust and Hatikva, which allows us to recognize that the Holocaust is not the reason that Israel came into existence, but rather the hope that brought Israel into existence was actually an aspect of Jewish life and identity long before the Holocaust. We see an intertwining of that hope, that thousands-year-old dream. We hear the stories from the Holocaust of singing Hatikva from within the gas chambers. I try to create usable resources so that people who don't already have this information can learn it but also engage with it in a really meaningful way. So sometimes there are activities and as I mentioned before some crafts that you can do, personal writing, I do a lot of creative writing encouragement so you look at a Holocaust survivor's testimony and then you're able to write your own reaction to it. What does it teach you about hope? Because if we only look at the Holocaust as this very ominous, sad, and painful event, or if we only look at it in comparison with what's happening today, which many people are doing, we need to somehow remind the world that the Holocaust happened because there was no Israel. There was no recognition of the Jewish right to live as a human being. And so it's very important for the Holocaust and Hatikva program that we try and emphasize to people that type of uh, symbiotic relationship that our identity is bound to Israel as it is to the type of suffering, not only in the Holocaust, but also, for example, in the Farhud, the destruction of the Jews of the Arab countries and the murders that never go documented. They always get forgotten, the entire realm of Mizrahi Jewish experience, the Sephardi Jewish experience. Have you heard many stories? And what sort of stories have you heard from the Holocaust survivors? Well, I myself interviewed several hundred throughout my years of research, and I'm very grateful for the stories that they've shared. Some can break your heart and some can lift your spirits. You know, I remember one of the first that I heard, I must have been 14 years old, actually, and she, Clara would tell me she worked in the kitchens in Auschwitz, but she lived in Birkenau. Birkenau being the extermination center, Auschwitz the political prisoners camp. And so her job was to work in the kitchen for the Nazis. And so she was, of course, always working with lard. And so she would wipe her hands on her dress throughout the day. And at the end of the day, she would come home and she would gently, with a stone, scrape the edge of the dress and pull off the fat and mold it so that every Friday she was able to light a candle for the welcoming of Shabbat. She would take a single thread from the bottom of her only dress and she would take that hardened lard and she would mold it. And I, I remember her telling me about the first time that the Blakova, the head of the block, was, watched her do this, her very first week in the camp. But she had to light Shabbat candles. And uh, she, the, the Blakova comes over and she smacks her and throws her to the ground. And then she picks her up and she says, now you light. And for a year and two months, she was able to light a Shabbat candle every week. When I was 14 years old, and I, it changed my life in a way, every story that I heard. This is just one of thousands I've collected. <laughs> is Israel a miracle today? Exiled twice, and yet you exist today? It is absolutely a miracle. To connect it, of course, with the survival and the Holocaust, it's important to realize that that was a miracle in itself. So as we learn from Ezekiel, the raising of from the ashes and bringing us home for rebirth, that has happened. And it is a miracle that deserves to be celebrated for all of its contribution to the world, not only for our rebirth and as a sovereign nation in our ancestral homeland. I think the miracle needs to be also celebrated of the type of diversity that Israel allows. I think what's happening today on our streets is an example of how thriving our democracy is, that there actually is no threat of dictatorship, and that what we're seeing is extremist rhetoric being pushed on all sides through types of brainwashing and indoctrination, that they are convinced this type of extremist language is going to get them to achieve what they want when it's not. But it is achieving a demonstration of just how democratic of a miracle we are in the region in which we live, in a volatile place where everybody is determined to destroy us. And yet here we are able to continue to thrive, not just survive, but to thrive. And that's the beauty of a Jewish state today. 
Today, does Israel have a right to exist to the land, and is it a biblical right, and how do you defend that right? I do believe that it is a biblical right, but I do believe that we live in a generation you cannot say that that is the source of the right. I think that it's very important to be able to teach people how to trace how the biblical right is proven throughout history. I think that more and more people should be aware of the original connection of Jews to the land so as to defeat some of the lies that are being spread today. And the most important way to accomplish that is to make it matter. And unfortunately, in a world where demonizing Jews is becoming increasingly popular, it's very hard to make Jewish life matter to somebody who is not Jewish. And that makes our non-Jewish supporters and friends in the world even more important. When I work with non-Jewish communities, you know, that's the righteous among the nations today. We don't have to be up against gas chambers and killing pits in order for the righteous among the nations to show themselves and to say, no matter what, I'm going to stand for the Jewish truth. And I think that is how we continue to survive and thrive for the next phase of our existence. Why do you do what you do? I do believe that God gave me the gift of being put in a position and being able to do what I do. I believe that from a very young age this was bestowed upon me and it was always a big question of whether it's a gift or a curse because it's very heavy. And so I do what I do because I was raised by some incredible people and learned under some incredible mentors who remind me all the time that as long as we can make a difference in one person, then we are making a difference. In the world that I'm witnessing today, from a historian perspective, we're not really seeing anything new. It's just a new face to old trends. And so I hope that if I can encourage people to take a step back from political bias and to take a step back from the lies and say, wait a second, is this a fact being offered? Or is this a position? Is it If somebody has an interest here, because a lot of times at the end of the day, most of the lies being spread about Israel, for example, are based on a deep-seated hatred or resentment of a Jew and the Jewish uniqueness and the Jewish being separate, the same reasons that we've been hated for thousands of years. This is part of human nature. So we want to, I believe that we can, I do what I do so that I can encourage more people to make it part of human nature to stand up and say, wait a second, no. And I think that's what makes a more dignified human being, somebody who will stand up and say the Jew deserves human rights as well. What's your hope for the future? that more people will allow Jews to live free without persecution and resentment and demonization and hate. My hope for the future is that our children in the Jewish world will be better educated and that we can figure out a way to discuss more easily the differences of opinion that we all share. Nobody is interested in uniformity of opinions, but there are smarter and healthier ways that we can navigate society and social interactions that I think not enough individuals are starting to do from the base of their home. And it starts with parents and it starts with grandparents. We want our education systems, for example, to be better. But that also starts with, well, how are we talking to our kids and how are we encouraging them to be a part of the hard conversations? How are we talking to our family members and learning how to communicate in healthier ways? And those are the kinds of things that will help hope for the future come to life. What's your website, Facebook page for people who'd like to know more? Absolutely. The Israel Forever Foundation. Our website is israelforever.org. We are on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter and on Pinterest and everywhere you want to be. And we're very, very small because you look at our website and we look like this massive. We're really just a small operation of me and a couple of really amazing women who are making magic by giving real-life resources for real-life people. So I hope that your listeners will be able to explore a different perspective, a personal perspective, on what it means that there is something beyond just the political state of Israel, but actually there is a nation, a heritage, a peoplehood. There is the definition of Zion that actually affirms our recognition of Jews and Jewish rights. Okay, Ilana, thank you very much. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and I wish you a lot of luck also in what you're doing.